This morning I'd like to talk about the things that break the heart of God. The things that break the heart of God. No one can break your heart like your children, right? They say stuff, they do stuff. They can break our hearts in a moment's notice. And according to the word of God, we are God's children. And sometimes we do things on purpose, and sometimes we do things by accident, and we just kind of break the heart of God. We disappoint him. And this morning I'd like to talk about three subjects that uh, we need to work on as a church, as a body of believers, so we don't uh, disappoint God, so we don't break his heart. You know, Satan comes to kill, destroy, to steal, and the only way he can get back at God is attacking God's children. That's us. That's why sometimes we have such a difficult time in our lives, because Satan is constantly after us, because he knows that this affects the heart of God. So what are we going to do about it? We're going to live more like Christ. That's the only thing we can do, right? Let's turn our Bibles to uh, uh, Luke chapter 17, starting at verse 11. Luke 17, 11. One of the first areas I like to talk about is uh, ungratefulness. Ungratefulness. We need to be a grateful people, but sometimes we are so ungrateful. But we need to work on that. And in this story here, let's start at verse 11. Now, on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. And as he was going to a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance, and they called out in a loud voice, Jesus! Master, have pity on us. And when he saw them, he said, Go, show yourself to the priest. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them went. When he saw he was healed, he came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet, and he thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. And Jesus asked, Were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then Jesus said to him, Rise and go. Your faith has made you well. In this story, we see ten people that were healed. Leprosy, one of the worst diseases you could possibly have because it took a long time to kill you. And when Jesus saw these ten lepers and they asked for help, Jesus healed each and every one of them. But how many came back to give him thanks? One. And the one wasn't even Jewish. And he came and he fell at Jesus' feet and he thanked him over and over again because he realized that now his life was restored. See, because when you had leprosy, you had no life. You had no future. You had a death sentence on your head. It was only going to get worse. Every day you woke up, you knew there was no cure. There was no way out. You were only going to get worse. But praise God, this one leopard came back to Jesus. And sometimes God does great things for you and for me. We all have houses. We all have some land. We all have cars. But do we take the time to give him thanks? Do we praise God? Every day should be Thanksgiving Day. But do we take the time to thank him for it? We need to wake up every day and say, thank you, Lord Jesus, for another day. Thank you, Lord God, that the AC works. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. And if it breaks, I thank the Jesus every day that when your AC is broken, I thank the Lord for that. <laughs> so you didn't know that. I pray every day, Lord, knock off some ACs. Give me some work. <laughs> but we need to be a thankful people. I don't think there's anything more disrespectful to a parent that a child is so ungrateful. You, you probably had some of those. We had a friend of ours in this church years ago that uh, his daughter, was in, she became 16 years old because when, you when you're 16, you want a car, right? So he went out and he got her a car. He needed some work. It was like a Camry or something like that. 
wasn't nothing like Ethan's car. It was just a regular plain Jane slow car. And the, and the father did all this effort. He, he rebuilt the engine. He washed it. He waxed it. He gave it to her. And you know what she said? Boy, it looks kind of rough, Dad. I'm not exactly sure I can drive this to school. All the other kids have new vehicles. So she took the car, and he knows that most of the time it's just set in the driveway. She, didn't, she was embarrassed to take it to school. Man, I praise God when I was 16 and somebody gave me a car. But she was ungrateful. So he did the right thing like any other parent would do. One day she came home from school and she goes, Dad, where's my car? He goes, oh, I sold your car. He sold it. And I don't blame him one bit. She was so ungrateful that she didn't have a new car. But sometimes we do the same thing, don't we? God blesses us and he, he helps us and he gives us stuff. And, but we don't take the time to thank him, you know? When I looked at Billy's truck last weekend, envy came over me. I go, Lord, why do I have this F-150 pickup truck that's worth about $150? How come I can't have something like Billy's got? And envy began to creep into my heart, and I had to rebuke that. And if you ever feel led, Billy, to give it to me, I will take it off your hands. What a blessing of the Lord. Thank you, Billy. You've heard the word of the Lord, right? Everybody agreed to that, right? No. But sometimes we do that, don't we? The Lord blesses us, he gives us stuff, and sometimes we are so ungrateful. But don't be like that, those nine leopards that they were killed and they never came back to thank the Lord God. We need to live like Paul, and Paul wrote this from prison. He said, I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I find myself in. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and everything, in every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We need to be people like that. I tell you, when we go on the mission field, it's amazing what I would call people that don't have anything, how grateful they are and how thankful they are. We'll be going in a couple weeks, going to St. Kitts, and we're going to bring down some school supplies. And you won't believe how happy a little kid gets when he gets a brand new pencil or a backpack. I mean, you talk about grateful, unbelievable. And we need to be just like that. No matter what God gives us, Either it's a, if it's an F-150 that's beat up or if it's a brand new Dodge Ram, every whistle, every bell you could possibly have on a pickup truck. Only thing it doesn't do is drive itself. And it probably does that too, I don't know. But we give God praise, right? Begin to become a praising, happy people, you know? We need to be learned how, like, like Paul said, we need to learn how to be content. And I find that a lot of Christians, they have a lot of stuff, but they're not content, they're not happy. They always want something else. You know, I have my own business, most of you know that, and I have two young men working for me, Chris Bosley and Ethan Decker. And I thank the Lord every day for them, because every job we do, every customer says the same thing. You have such great workers. They show respect. They're nice to me. They don't cuss and carry on. And I praise God for both of them. I give God thanks because he has sent them to me. And I can take a little bit of you know, credit because I helped raise Bosley, even though he's my red-headed son, even though he's not my son. But praise God. Look what the Lord has done. He was just sharing about his life not too long ago, you know, being in jail and stuff like that. You don't know things about Chris like that. The Lord has turned his whole life around. And I praise God that he can do that to anybody that we take the time. Show so respect. You know, be people that say, Lord God, no matter what I have, I give you praise. What's the second area that sometimes we have problems in and it affects God's heart? It's our lack of faith sometimes, right? 
lack of faith. It says this, faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. We must stand strong and not waver on God. James chapter 1 says this about a person that wavers. He go, he's, he's for God and then he's not for God. And he's for God and he's not for God. And his faith is like that back and forth. James says this, that person should expect to receive nothing from God. Such a person is double-minded, unstable in all he does. Don't be unstable. Let your faith be strong in Jesus. I don't know who said this, but this is exactly what we need all need to learn how to believe. It's real simple. God said it. I believe it. And that settles it. And that's the kind of faith God is looking for us to have. That his word says this, and I believe it. How many people here have a, have a cell phone? All of you. Now stay off your cell phone while I'm preaching. I'll come down and take it from you. No, I'm just like, Jeff, put your cell phone down. No. How many people have the Bible app? If you don't have the Bible app, you need to get one. Man, it is a great, I don't know much about technology, but it is so good. Man, you can be in your truck or be in your car and you start playing the scriptures, man. You get so much Bible in one day. So there's no excuse that we don't know the Word of God. So instead of turning on the radio or playing that song that no one could care less about, turn on your phone. Begin to listen to the Word of God. And you'll be amazed what God can do in you because the Word of God doesn't return void. Even when you're driving, you know, turn it on for a little bit. You know, give God that time and learn how to do that. Because it says in uh, Hosea chapter 4, it says, My people, they perish because of lack of wisdom. Why are they perishing? Because they don't know anything about the Bible. Don't, don't know anything about the Word of God. They don't know how to live their life. We should never be people like that. Our faith comes by hearing and hearing the Word of God. And it's so important that we hear the Word of God every day. You know why? Because we forget. We forget what God says. It's amazing. When you look at your life, and you're walking by faith, when you look at the past, how many times has God come through? Every time. How many, God, how many times has God always met your need? Every time. I was just talking to Vera. I mean, she was just praising God. She was preaching my sermon because she was telling me how God has come through every time. She needed money, and a lawyer called her. A lawyer. Now, believe me, lawyers don't like to call you and give back your money, but that's exactly what is happening? Walking by faith. We need to be faith people. If we want to fill this church, and I believe that's God's will, we have to realize that God said he can heal, and we believe it. When we lay hands on the sick, we expect them to be healed. We don't hope they're healed. We don't care. We, we, we don't, maybe they'll get healed. We, we know they will get healed. We have to be that type of people. Build up our faith. <clears throat> you know how you build up your faith? Besides reading the word of God? You hang around people that, that walk by faith. So if, you, if you're hanging around people that said, oh my gosh, you got COVID. Oh my goodness. You're going to be dead by morning. Don't hang around those people. <laughs> Don't. Especially if that person says, hey, listen, am, can I have your tools? <laughs> am I on your insurance policy? Don't hang around those people. Hang around people that are faith people. We have some strong faith people in here that God has come through every time. Hang around those people. And then pray for those that are saying, oh, you got COVID, you're going to be dead by the end of the day. You know, we need to pray for those. God can bring you through. And he does all the time. So let's help us put our trust and our hope and our being in Jesus' hands because it's in his hands anyway. 
So let's trust him. So let's be people of faith. God loves people of faith. And when you have that, when you don't have faith, ask God to give you some, for he will. He'll build you up. And what's the third thing that breaks the heart of God? And I see this evident in a lot of churches. The unconcern for the lost. God wants us to be concerned about lost people. Proverbs 11, 30 says, He that winneth souls is wise. Jesus said this, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. We as a church, we need to be so concerned about our neighbors, our co-workers, our friends, the non-believers, that we share the gospel every opportunity we get. I love what Francis of Assisi said years ago. He said these words, Go into all the world and preach the gospel. And if necessary, use words. People are looking at your life and my life. You're probably the only Bible they'll ever read. So live the life. Walk by faith. Share the word of God. A young man told me this the other day. He said, well, I don't want to shove religion down other people's throats. First of all, you're not sharing a religion. You're sharing a relationship. You're sharing the only way out. Jesus Christ said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No man can get into heaven except through me. I know what the world says. The world says all religions are nice and they all lead to heaven. That is such a lie from hell. Don't ever believe that. And never, ever give up on someone. Always pray. Always look for opportunity to share the gospel in words and in deeds. A lot of times, the greatest gospel you can share is doing something nice for somebody. Going the extra mile. Going to buy somebody groceries. Driving a half an hour, 45 minutes through traffic on 95 and going somewhere to to go buy somebody groceries that can't get to the grocery store. That is a ministry. I'm impressed with that. That is the gospel with feet. Sharing Jesus. John chapter 4. It says, <clears throat> There came a woman from Samaria to draw water. And Jesus said, give me drink. Jesus went through Samaria one time and he met this woman, we call her the woman at the well, an outcast, a woman who had been married five times and now gave up on marriage and just was living with this guy. But Jesus knew, as I go through Samaria, this outcast is going to change this city for Jesus. And when Jesus asked that Samaritan woman, give me something to drink, she was shocked. Like, why are you bothering even to ask me? I am Samaritan, you are Jew. You're up here, I'm down here. Why are you even talking to me? And the disciples said the same thing. Why is he even talking to this woman? Why is he wasting his time with this outcast? Why, is, why aren't we just going through Samaria and get to Jerusalem where we're supposed to go? Because Jesus knew that every soul mattered. And because Jesus took the time and asked this woman to give me a drink, as you read this story, when you go home, that's your assignment today, that's your homework, you read John chapter 4 about the Samaritan woman. 
it says that she went back into the city because Jesus revealed to her that the, the Messiah that you're looking for, I'm the guy. You don't have to look any further. Very unusual for Jesus to reveal himself like that. And he revealed himself to a Samaritan woman. And she went back so fired up that she told the whole town to come out and see a man that knows all about me. And because of that one contact, the whole city was saved. And they came out and Jesus moved on that city, a Samaritan city, and changed that whole town because of one woman. Because he knew that he had to be concerned for the lost. Because the way it works, there's only two places, heaven or hell, that's it. There's no in-between, there's no purgatory, and we need to be concerned like Jesus was to share the gospel because it is worth it in the end. Like it says, he who wins souls is wise. About a year ago, I was with my brother Frank. His wife is here today. And I shared the gospel with my brother time and time and time again, and nothing ever seemed to work. Nothing ever seemed to click. And about a year ago, we were down there fishing, and I knew he was really, really sick. He had lung cancer, and the cancer had spread to different parts of his body. Because we always fished at like 5 or 6 in the afternoon, and by 1 o'clock, he was ready to come home. And as he got into my van hour and a half, can't escape, doors are locked, just me and you and Jesus. And I laid out the whole plan of salvation, and I asked him that most important question, would you like to give your heart to Jesus? And I'll never forget what he said. He said, you believe that, but I don't. And I said, I could have took offense to that. I could have said, what is wrong with you, boy? You are my brother. We were raised in the same house. You know the gospel. But I said this. I said, Frank, if you ever want to come to know Jesus, you call me day, night, Saturday, Sunday, anytime. You call me, and I'll be there. And just a few weeks later on, he went to the hospital, went into a coma. He had a vision of where he was going to end up. And it wasn't a, a real nice vision. And when he came out of that coma, the first thing he told his wife, Pam, Call Frank, call Dave, call Dave. And when I got that phone call, I was shocked. And I shared the gospel thing, and he gave his heart to Jesus over the phone that day. Unbelievable. And I wasn't quite sure, you know. I know my brother, I wasn't quite sure, so I went to go visit him the next day. I wanted to see him, I wanted to know that I know. So he got home, and I went down to Culpeper, down that area, got into his house, and he was a changed person. The Lord had got into his heart and changed him from the inside out. He made him a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I am so glad that I took the time to say it one more time. And the word of the Lord for you today is don't give up on anybody. One more time. Now he is in heaven walking streets of gold, and I'm down here with you guys. What kind of deal is that? 
I'm envious. But praise be to God, I know where he's at today. There's no doubt in my mind. And I give God all the glory. For, he, for God gave him one more chance. So be concerned about the, un, the unsaved. Like Jesus did at the woman at the well. You never know. You never know. I read this, this, this statistic the other day, and I hope it's not true. It says in almost all churches, 70% of those who are in the congregation have never led anybody to Jesus. That should not be, church. We should all be soul winners for the Lord. We should all have a testimony. We should all have a word. We should all do something for God. For it, that's all that really matters. It doesn't matter how much land or houses you have or how much money you have in the bank. One day, you'll stand before a living, holy God, and he'll either say two things to you. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Or he'll say, depart from me, for I never knew you. That's it. And we need to be those type of people that we are so concerned about the lost. That's why Jesus told his disciples, don't say four more months and then comes the harvest. Today is the day of harvest, for the fields are white unto harvest. We need to be about the Father's business. Every day there's opportunities, and we need to open our mouth, share the gospel. And if you don't know how to do that, Hang around Linda for about a day. You one day with Linda will show you how to do it. And the reason she's that way, because she knows it's the most important thing in this world. To snatch those out of the fire into heaven's gates. So be concerned about the lost. Be concerned about your friends and your family and your relatives and your neighbors. Be concerned about them because one day they will stand before a holy God. And if they don't know Jesus, it's not going to be pleasant. In 1912, there was a preacher. His name was John Harper. He was on the great ship called the Titanic. He was coming to America to, to preach at D.L. Moody's church. And we all know what happened to that ship. And as the ship was going down and people were getting to the lifeboats, he put his daughter in the lifeboat and his sister. His wife had already passed away years ago. <clears throat> and there was room for him in the boat. He could have easily got into that boat because a lot of people said, oh, this ship's not going to sink. I'm not going that little teeny boat lifeboat I'm not going to take a chance on that and he and he told his daughter and told his sister there's work for me to do so he didn't get into the lifeboat and for the next 2 hours he preached the gospel to those that were perishing and I don't know how many people came to know Jesus during those 2 hours as the boat sank but I can guarantee you one thing those that listened to him are so glad for that preacher from Scotland, John Harper. One of the last guys he preached to, because he preached the sermon, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. That was his sermon. And when the boat finally did go down, he swam to people and he shared the gospel, knowing that he only had about maybe five to seven minutes before the water would take him down. And he swam up to this one guy, and he said, wouldn't you like to be saved? And the guy goes, no, I, I really don't want to be saved. I don't really believe that. And John swam away, and he came back, and he asked him again. But this time, the guy bowed his head and accepted Jesus. And then he said he watched John Harper go down under the water. And then about a minute later, here comes a lifeboat, and pulled him out, saved his life. And a year later, he's doing 
they had like a little service, and he was there, and he was sharing his testimony how God has saved his life through this preacher. And he thanked the Lord that God gave him one more chance. See, the people that are around us, they're on the Titanic. They don't know it. They don't know that their ship is going down. They think they got plenty of time. We need to be like John Harper and share the gospel because it's the most important thing. So today, my prayer is that we'll be more grateful people that's my prayer. That when God blesses you, you will thank him. My prayer is that your faith will grow as you read the word of God and as you seek the Lord Jesus Christ. And my prayer is that you will see the lost, how they really are. They're lost. They're on that ship, and the ship is going down and they don't even know it. So today, <clears throat> my prayer is that you will be a soul winner for Jesus. Think about it. If everybody brought one person to church, we would double in one day. And then the following week, if everybody brought one person to church, we'd have to sit them on the floor. It's possible. Why? Because Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. And the reason we know about Jesus today is because of those 11 disciples. They did just that. The reason we have Jesus in our hearts today is because those disciples gave their lives for the Lord Jesus Christ. And see, we live in America. It is so easy to share the gospel. Some will reject it, and some will accept it. We have a young man in our congregation. His name is Yasser. He's from Pakistan. He doesn't want to be in America. He, to be, he wants to be home with his family. But see, it's so dangerous for him to be there because he's a Christian. He's a Christian. Can you imagine that, that you have to flee your homeland because you're a Christian? So people, we are without excuse. We need to be soul winners for Jesus. Shout it from the rooftop. And if they tell you to get out of my face, I don't want to hear it, get out of their face, come back the next day. That's my advice, come back the next day. For you never know. You never know. Just like my brother. You never know.